Back when I was in university, I worked nights at a pub a few miles from my parents' house. We lived in the countryside, so I had to commute to nearby Leeds on weekday mornings. On weekends, I spent my nights earning much-needed beer money. When my late shift at the pub ended, I had to walk about two and a half miles along narrow, poorly lit country lanes to get home. We had a taxi service in the nearby village, but on weekends it was pretty much fully booked. Besides, I didn't want to spend my nightly wages on a taxi. One of the great things about working in countryside pubs was the phenomenal tips. The sense of community and old-fashioned values meant that farm hands and landed gentry alike always tipped on their orders. Sometimes it was just 20 pence, but occasionally they'd leave four or five pounds of change, especially when they'd had a few too many and were feeling generous. My shifts usually ended at about 11.30 p.m. once last orders had been called and we'd clean down the bars. All the staff would usually hang around for a drink until about midnight before going our separate ways. One Saturday had been particularly busy. The weather was spectacular and there had been some kind of garden festival in the area. This meant all kinds of people from near and far had visited the pub, adding to my tips. By the end of the night, I had 112 euro. It was more money than I'd ever had in my life, and I didn't want to waste any of it on a taxi. A belly full of lager would see me home with no problems. So off I went, merrily meandering home, feeling like a very rich man as I planned how to spend my newfound fortune. It was dark out, really dark, with only a sliver of the moon to light my way but I was too buzzed and cheerful to care. About a mile into the journey home, I was blasting some ACDC in my earphones when I saw the lights of a car coming up behind me. It passed slowly at first, and I thought the driver might ask for directions, but the car just kept going. Since the festival was on, I thought nothing of not recognizing the vehicle or its driver. But once the car had passed me by about 200 yards, it just stopped in the middle of the road. I watched it sit there for a minute, continuing on my way until it dawned on me that it wasn't going to just drive off. I got the weirdest feeling that it was waiting for me. I know that sounds paranoid, but sometimes you just get a bad feeling about something, a tight feeling in your stomach that tells you something is badly wrong. So I stopped walking and stood at the side of the road, staring at the car's rear lights until it finally revved its engine and took off into the night. I wasn't freaked out, thanks to the beer. If this had happened while I was sober, I'd have been much more scared. I'm not a tough guy at all. So when a couple of minutes later I saw a pair of headlights coming at me from the opposite side of the road, I wasn't worried. I just kept walking as the car passed me, but I realized it was the same car from before. Just like before, it stopped a couple of hundred yards down the road from me. I was now convinced it was a car full of city folks who had managed to get lost in the dark. Again, I stopped at the side of the road, waiting for it to reverse so the driver could ask for directions, but it didn't. The car did a U-turn in the middle of the lane then switched off its headlights and began to creep slowly down the road towards me. I wasn't freaked out before, but I was then. I was completely and utterly terrified. I had no idea what the driver's intentions were, but they were obviously not good. My head was spinning with grim ideas of what they were planning robbery, kidnapping, or worse. I just started running, looking for a gap in the hedgerows so I could jump into one of the nearby fields to hide. I finally found one, scrambling over the dry stone wall and badly scraping my elbows in the process. My first thought was to grab my phone from my backpack to call the police, but the light from the screen meant the driver would find me quickly. I panicked, threw it back in my bag, and decided hiding was my best option. Even if I got through to the police, it would take them a while to get there, and it might be too late by then. So I crouched at the base of the hedge, terrified, 
just trying to hide so the driver would think I'd run off over the fields. The only thing I could rely on at that point was my sense of hearing. I was listening for footsteps, the car's engine, anything to give me an idea of what was happening on the other side of the hedge. A couple of minutes felt like half an hour, and in that time I hadn't heard a single thing from the road. When it felt safe to check, I started to slowly edge towards the section of hedge I'd jumped over, ready to peek over the dry stone wall for any signs of the car. Right then, I heard the sound of car doors slamming not one door, but two or three, all closing at once. The car hadn't moved that whole time they'd been sitting in the middle of a dark country lane, waiting for me to emerge. My heart was pounding. I can't convey how terrifying it is to know you're being hunted by a gang of complete strangers. I just bolted, hurtling across the dark field towards a small wooded area. I knew the area well, so despite not knowing exactly where I'd end up, it didn't matter. It was either run or face being caught by the guys hunting me. I hid out in the woods for as long as I could, watching the field I'd just crossed for shadows or torches, but again, there was nothing. When the coast was clear, I took off in the opposite direction, crossing fields and staying off the roads until I found my way back home. Even though it was the middle of the night, I woke my mom and dad and told them exactly what had happened. Naturally, they called the police and arranged for some officers to visit the next morning so I could give a description. A month or so went by and we heard nothing. I'd stopped walking home and started paying for taxes to ensure I got back safe. I was managing to forget about what had happened or at least let it slip to the back of my mind. That's when the police called back. The guys had been arrested for committing an assault on an elderly man just a few villages away from us. They were part of a gang based in nearby Leeds, where I went to university, that would drive out into the country at night, where there were hardly any CCTV cameras, before assaulting people as part of some initiation. I was glad they'd been caught, but it still bothers me that some people are so willing to commit violence against a total stranger. I still walk places at night sometimes, but I don't use noise-canceling headphones anymore, and I always carry a small penknife just in case. If you work night shifts, I'd recommend you do the same. You never know who's out there lurking in the darkness, just waiting to make someone a victim. Last weekend, my wife, my son, and I went camping in the forest. My son is only six years old and loves playing outside. We thought it would be a good idea to let him experience the wilderness. The drive to the campsite was about two hours long, and we reached there just before sunset. We set up our tent and prepared a small campfire. My wife and I took turns telling stories to our son, who was thrilled by the adventure. As night fell, the forest became eerily quiet. The only sounds were the crackling of the campfire and the occasional rustling of leaves. We were in the middle of nowhere with no other campers nearby. My wife and I were a bit uneasy but didn't want to show it in front of our son. We roasted marshmallows and enjoyed the peaceful surroundings. Around midnight, we decided to go to sleep. We put out the campfire and settled into our tent. My son fell asleep almost immediately exhausted from the day's activities. My wife and I lay awake for a while, listening to the sounds of the forest. It was then that we heard something unusual, a low, growling sound coming from the darkness. It sounded like an animal, but we couldn't tell what kind. I grabbed a flashlight and slowly unzipped the tent. The growling grew louder, and my wife held our son close, trying to keep him calm. I stepped out of the tent and shone the flashlight around. The beam of light revealed a pair of glowing eyes staring back at me from the bushes. My heart raced as I realized we were being watched by a wild animal. I quickly retreated into the tent and zipped it up. My wife whispered, asking what it was. 
I told her it was an animal but couldn't tell what kind. We decided to stay inside the tent and wait for the animal to leave. We sat in silence, listening to the growling that seemed to be getting closer. After what felt like hours, the growling finally stopped. We waited a bit longer to make sure the animal was gone before daring to peek outside. The forest was dark and quiet again. We breathed a sigh of relief and tried to get some sleep, but it was hard to relax after such a scare. The next morning we found large paw prints near our campsite. We couldn't identify the animal, but the prints were big enough to belong to a large predator. We decided it was best to pack up and leave. While we enjoyed our time in the forest, the encounter with the wild animal was a reminder of how unpredictable nature can be. We made it home safely, and our son couldn't stop talking about the adventure. Despite the scare, he was eager to go camping again. My wife and I agreed that next time we'd choose a campsite closer to other people. The experience taught us to be more cautious and prepared for the unexpected. Almost 20 years ago, I worked the overnight shift at an animal shelter. Although it was a long time ago, something happened one night that has burned into my memory. I can recall the whole thing like it was yesterday, the textures, the smells. It's something I've carried with me for nearly two decades. My shifts were from 11 at night until 7 in the morning, a solid eight hours of sleeplessness that grounded me down over time. Night shifts can be good if you need the money, even better if you're antisocial, but the lifestyle grinds you down. I had a full vitamin D deficiency after just six months of working there. It's not a healthy way to live. The animal shelter itself was a pretty big place, a horseshoe-shaped building complete with a waiting area, a series of offices, a medical examination room, and of course hundreds of kennels and cages. Aside from once a week when the overnight cleaning staff were there, I spent all of my shifts alone behind the shelter's reception desk. That gave me a direct line of sight through the security glass of the shelter's front doors. My only duties were to monitor the emergency phone line, check on the animals now and then, and do some basic filing. I packed a few snacks and sandwiches for when I got hungry mid-shift, and every so often I'd call up the 24-hour pizza joint just a few miles away and get them to deliver a box of hot, cheesy joy to push me through the night. Sure, the hours sucked, but working at the animal shelter gave me a great deal of freedom, and it paid really well. It was quite a happy time in my life, which is why I remember this story so well. It was such a non-event in an otherwise joyful time in my life. On the rare occasion that someone came in, it was to drop off a stray animal that they had found or one they could no longer care for. The shelter was always happy to take them in and make them as comfortable as possible. It was kind of nice being the first point of contact for a lot of these animals. Many were nervous or scared, and calming them down with treats and petting was more fulfilling than words can describe. I made a lot of furry friends during my employment at the shelter. The only exception to the shelter's rescue policy applied to fighting dogs or other animals deemed too dangerous. One night, something happened that I can never forget. It was about 2 a.m. and I was sitting at the reception desk, half asleep, when I heard a strange noise coming from the back of the shelter. It was a low, growling sound that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I grabbed my flashlight and walked cautiously towards the sound. As I approached the kennels, the growling grew louder, and I could hear the animals becoming agitated. I shined my flashlight into the kennels but didn't see anything unusual. Suddenly, a large, shadowy figure darted across the room and disappeared into the darkness. I was frozen with fear, unable to move or make a sound. I stood there for what felt like an eternity listening to the growling and the restless animals. 
Finally, I mustered the courage to move and slowly backed away towards the reception desk. I locked myself in and called the police, telling them that there was an intruder in the shelter. They arrived within minutes, but after a thorough search of the entire building, they found nothing. There was no sign of forced entry, and all the animals were accounted for. To this day, I have no idea what I saw or what was in the shelter that night, but I know that it was real, and it was something that I will never forget. The experience left me shaken, and I eventually left the job a few months later. But the memory of that night still haunts me, and I often wonder what it was that I encountered in the darkness of the animal shelter. Back in my early 20s, I worked for a small security contractor. It was a privately owned operation with around 30 employees, so we were all pretty tight. We would get contracts with factories or shopping malls, and it was our job to sit in those locations for 8 to 12 hours at a time when they were closed. Often I found myself standing guard overnight, completely alone in a totally empty facility. In my two years of working security, I never saw anything supernatural. I laugh at the nonsense stories about seeing spirits or hearing voices from beyond. For anyone who has worked night jobs, it's not ghosts you need to be afraid of, it's people. With that in mind, let me tell you about Pete. After about a year with the security firm, I was given the responsibility of training new team members. This meant more money, but also dealing with some unsavory candidates. So when my boss called me to meet a trainee at a distant site at 5 in the morning, I wasn't thrilled but accepted for the double pay. The next morning I arrived at the factory complex, still half asleep and nursing a flask of coffee. It was about a quarter to five, and I stepped out of my car to smoke while I waited. A car soon pulled up, and I assumed it was the trainee. As it slowed down, the engine revved wildly, and the car took off again. I was startled and just stood there as the car began circling the parking lot erratically. I thought, great, I'm going to be training some twitchy tweaker when the car finally parked near me. The driver just stared at me suspiciously from his seat. As I stared back, I noticed two kids in the back seat. I decided to approach the car, but the driver, a guy in his late 20s, quickly got out and greeted me with a wide, unsettling grin. He introduced himself as Pete and apologized for being late. He claimed the kids in the back were his nephews, whom he was babysitting and had to bring along. Something felt off about Pete from the start. His eyes were bloodshot and his speech was erratic. He mentioned that he had a long night and was running on fumes. I tried to make small talk, but his responses were either overly enthusiastic or strangely evasive. We made our way into the factory, and I began the training. Pete kept fidgeting and looking around nervously, which made me even more uneasy. He asked bizarre questions about the job, like whether we were allowed to carry weapons or what the protocol was if someone tried to break in. I tried to keep things professional and focused on the training, but his behavior was becoming more erratic. At one point, I asked him to watch the monitors while I checked the perimeter. When I returned, he was nowhere to be found. I searched the building and found him in the break room, rummaging through the cabinets. He jumped when he saw me and mumbled something about looking for coffee. I decided to cut the training short and called my boss to report Pete's strange behavior. My boss told me to send Pete home and that they would handle it from there. I walked Pete back to his car and he kept apologizing, saying he was just tired and nervous about the new job. I watched as he drove off, still feeling uneasy about the whole encounter. A few days later, I learned that Pete had been arrested. He had been involved in several break-ins and was suspected of planning to use the security job as a cover for future crimes. The kids in the car weren't his nephews he had kidnapped them earlier that morning. Thankfully, they were found safe and returned to their parents. 
This experience taught me to trust my instincts and be cautious of the people around me. Working in security, you never know who you might encounter or what their intentions might be. It's not the ghosts you need to worry about, it's the real life monsters. During my 20s, I served as an ammunition systems technician in the US. Air Force, stationed at a massive ordnance storage facility in Germany. This place encompassed around a dozen buildings, including many underground bunkers that contained thousands of bombs. The facility spanned approximately 11 or 12 square miles. One particular storage site was completely forested and heavily populated with wildlife, unlike most sites, which were deforested due to the fire hazard. This part of Bavaria mandated that the area be maintained as a natural preserve. Twice a day, we had to run perimeter security checks to ensure no holes had been cut through the fence and all buildings were closed and locked. These checks were conducted by the morning and afternoon crews unless they failed to do so. Unfortunately, one time they did mess up, leading to an eventful night. At around 1 a.m., Someone from command realized there hadn't been an evening security check. In a panic, they bolted down to our office and ordered us to complete it before we all faced discipline. We were not happy about this. As my buddy and I had just finished our regular duties and settled in to play Xbox for an hour or two. Naturally, we were the ones voluntold to go do it. Reluctantly, we grabbed our radios and flashlights and headed to the motor pool to get a truck. First, we conducted the perimeter fence check. It wasn't a massive task, but we had to drive slowly to get a good look, making it a time-consuming ordeal. Around 2 a.m., we started the building checks. My buddy wanted a smoke break before continuing since the check would take another hour or so. He shut off the truck and dropped the tailgate, and we stood in utter darkness while he smoked. To this day, I don't know why he chose to shut off the ignition. When we tried to start the truck again, nothing happened. The ignition wouldn't fire no attempt to turn over, no sputters, nothing. We assumed we had a dead battery and radioed into command about the breakdown. We were met with silence. Again and again, we tried, but still we received no response. After thumbing the radio for a good five minutes, we accepted that we would have to walk all the way back to the barracks. We should have stayed on the road, which would have required us to walk about a kilometer to the main roadway, then turn east for another three miles. It wasn't a particularly long walk, but we were majorly angry about being stuck out there. Foolishly, we decided to take a shortcut through the woods. The trees were so dense that it was hard to navigate, even with our flashlights. It had only been about 20 minutes since we left the truck, but it felt like hours. We ran through the woods as fast as our legs could carry us until we found a clearing. We turned off our flashlights and began to stalk backward towards the bunker, sidearms drawn and safeties off. Panting, we watched the door, knowing we had to shut it. Terrified, we walked up to it slowly, careful not to shine our flashlights into the opening. About three feet from the door, we gathered our courage and pounced, slamming and bolting the door shut before anything could escape. Relieved, we started up the gravel road towards the main roadway, ready to report that we had something trapped inside the still unsecured Unit 65. However, as we were about half a mile away from the barracks, another howl echoed through the forest. We froze. The sound was coming from just ahead of us, a horrible, gut-twisting sound. I shined my flashlight around, but there was nothing but dense, dark foliage. I began to sense movement and saw eyes glowing in the beam of my flashlight. Panicking, I sent the beam to and fro, revealing more and more pairs of glowing yellow eyes emerging from the pitch black night. We were literally surrounded by huge yellow eyes fixed on us. 
I couldn't breathe or make a sound, we were frozen in utter terror. Then, a whole herd of deer rose from their sleeping spots and lazily cantered away. We both began howling with laughter, feeling immense relief. Once we laughed off the scare, we walked the rest of the way back to our barracks. The combination of trudging through pitch black woods and hearing the screams had primed us for sheer terror by the time we stumbled upon the herd of deer. Normally, deer feed at night, but it was one of those especially dark, moonless nights when even they decided it was too creepy to go out. The screams turned out to be a now yeah and pow of all things. A preliminary investigation discovered that a group of German teenagers from a nearby town had broken into the bomb depot. They had no idea what was inside and were terrified when they discovered the bombs, hence their running and leaving the doors wide open. As a result, heads did roll. The colonel on base was moved on, and his replacement was a real hard nose. Despite our dislike for the new co, there were never any more incidents requiring us to walk through the woods in the early hours, and for that we were extremely grateful. Back when I was still a teenager, I took a part-time job stocking shelves at Meijer. Like a lot of kids my age, I was automatically given the night shift. No kids, no school, you're on the third shift. A lot of people resent that and don't even bother turning up for their first shifts, but the schedule kind of suited me. I've always been a night owl, so getting to work when I would normally be awake anyways was something that never really bothered me. One morning, as I walked down the center aisle, I noticed this guy walking through the store. He looked to be an older guy wearing a poorly fitted suit. I didn't really think anything of it at first because sometimes the regional manager would show up early. As we approached one another, I could get a good view of his face. When we got within 10 feet of each other, I wished him a good morning, but I still couldn't really see his face all that well. He gave a cheerful good morning response, and I just continued on my way to the stockroom without giving it too much thought. The manager of the morning team entered the stockroom and started giving me instructions for the seasonal items I'd be dealing with that morning. After she finished giving me my action items, I asked who the corporate guy was who'd visited that morning. She gave me this weird look, let out a little laugh, and then told me that we weren't expecting anyone. She asked for a description, and I shared it with her. She felt it could be the new regional marketing guy. But that couldn't be, because he doesn't have keys. And they never come at 2 a.m. She darted off to the neighboring admin office to find out if anyone was expected, and I went back to work. A little while later, my manager came back with more questions about the guy I'd seen. She actually asked me if I was trying to prank her. When I said no, she decided to get a better look at this guy in the suit via one angle. We could make out the same dark shape that must have been the visitor, only this time it was moving around really fast and low to the ground. It was almost like he was running on all fours like an animal. I told her there was no way the guy I saw was so athletic. He was well into his fifties and looked pretty frail in that poorly fitting suit. We then checked the cameras covering the entrances from the time we'd all arrived, trying to catch the guy leaving to get a better look at him. It slowly dawned on us that whoever I had seen wandering the aisles was still in the store, hiding, lurking somewhere. It was at that point that my manager decided to call the cops. For safety reasons, the manager called all team members to the staff lounge on the pretense of a team meeting. She told the 911 dispatcher to come to the back of the building because she felt the intruder was still in the middle of the store. We continued to look through different camera angles until the police made their way to our office. Two officers walked in and we started to relay the information that we could. After explaining that we believed the person was still in the building, one cop said that he would stay with us and the other volunteered to walk the floor. The cop that stayed asked me to see the CCTV footage. 
I sat there watching the cop's face instead of the video footage. He was obviously confused and disturbed by what he was seeing. At one point he even asked us if we were sure it wasn't a stray dog or something. He looked at the video system hardware and asked my manager what year it was purchased. She explained that it was brand new and had been recently tested and there was no reason that any blurring or distortion should be occurring. He started to question the quality of the video and then I told him I saw the guy that morning, but he looked normal. Considering it was dark, I explained that we both said good morning and he was wearing typical business clothes. I had definitely not imagined this whole thing. Within 10 minutes, additional patrolmen began to show up and they completed a comprehensive search of the store area. We all stayed in the back watching the cops watch the video. After looking through all the video and searching the floor, nobody was found and no video showed him leaving. They got out their paperwork and started to interview us. During this time, we viewed all camera angles in fast mode to see if we could see him before we all arrived. We found one instance where a coat fell from a hanger onto the ground, but nothing near it. No video of anyone except the crew that closed. The entry system log was shared showing no intrusion or access request was made. In the end, they had no idea who it was or what exactly happened. A report was filed and the video was taken. The cops went to the neighboring stores and went through their video feeds nothing. We opened up at the usual time and no shells were stocked beforehand. I'm not saying that what happened that morning was anything supernatural, but this guy's ability to just show up and disappear is something I've never forgotten. Strange people are out there in the wee small hours of the morning, and I just pray I never have to run into him again. It was pretty quiet at the gas station. It was around a quarter till 10, and there were no customers in the store. My coworker and I were doing the usual cleaning chores. I was busy cleaning the large glass doors when my coworker said something to me. I turned to respond, then when I turned back to cleaning the glass door, I nearly wet myself as I saw a tall man in a sweater wearing a beanie and, most disturbingly, a black face mask. My mind began racing as I reached for my keychain to lock the door, but the man was moving too fast and was inside before I could unclip the keys from my pants. The man looked at me, and in my mind I thought he was sizing me up. I readied myself for whatever this guy planned to do. My heart was racing a mile a second, and I almost thought that this was going to be it, that we were about to be robbed. That's when the man pulled his mask down and revealed his face. He asked if we had restrooms and I gestured towards them. As he walked away, he pulled his mask up again as he passed my coworker who was quickly but quietly coming up to me. We both were shocked at what was going on, but hoped that this guy meant no harm. Five minutes later, the guy came back from the restroom and quickly left the store. After a little while, my heart stopped racing and things calmed down. That's when I made a realization. I had seen a man who looked a lot like the masked man walking around the station and peering through the windows. I don't know if they were the same person, but after thinking about it for a bit, I realized the guy might have been thinking about causing trouble. When he saw my 6 at 200 pound coworker walking towards him, he decided against it. I had to go back to close the station tonight. I will be carrying extra protective measures on my person, but I am hoping he doesn't return or if he does. He doesn't have that mask. Every gas station employee has that fear of a holdup. Last year, a station in the same chain I worked for in the same city was robbed, so the fear is especially real for me. The next morning, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease from the night before. I decided to tell my manager about the incident as soon as I arrived at work. She took my concern seriously and reviewed the security footage from the previous night. We saw the man enter the store and head towards the restrooms, just as I had described. But what we saw next sent chills down my spine. 
the man was loitering around the store, peering at various items and checking out the layout as if he were planning something. My manager decided it was best to inform the police. An officer came by later that day to review the footage and take our statements. He mentioned that there had been reports of suspicious activity at other gas stations in the area. They promised to keep an eye on our station and advised us to stay vigilant. That night I felt a bit more at ease knowing the police were aware of the situation. My co-worker and I made sure to keep the doors locked and only allowed one customer inside at a time. Despite our precautions, the memory of the masked man still lingered in the back of my mind. Every time the door chimed, my heart would skip a beat, but thankfully the night passed without incident. Days turned into weeks, and there were no more sightings of the masked man. Eventually, the police informed us that they had arrested someone matching his description who was connected to several robberies in the area. It was a relief to know that the man was caught, but the experience left a lasting impression. It taught me the importance of staying alert and trusting my instincts, especially in a job where safety can never be taken for granted. I've worked at a graveyard for the past 15 years, most of those years being the typical graveyard shift, which was from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. In my mind, working overnight had way more benefits than working during the day. Workers had more to do since more people would be visiting the yard. There would also be burials taking place a few times a week that needed to be arranged. Above everything else, the night shift gets paid an extra $2 an hour. I've seen a lot during my years working the night shift, though mostly teens messing around or the occasional drunk group of friends daring each other to walk through the yard. However, this night was different. I got to the small faculty building a bit early to chat with the day worker, and once he left, I did all of the normal checks and precautions at the beginning of my shift. Afterwards, my only job was really just to drive around in a golf cart every so often and just make sure nothing was going on. I'd say I only encountered something once a month or maybe even every other month. Anyway, the first few hours were normal. I drove around several times then went back to the small faculty building to eat my lunch. I think it was around 2 a.m. when I went back out to do another round of the yard. As I got to the far end, I saw something by the fence. It was obviously really dark, so I couldn't see much more than the general shape of a figure standing there. I drove up closer. I could tell now that it was a man standing on the outside of the fence looking toward me. I didn't want to confront him if I didn't have to, so I turned and drove in a small loop around the lot to see if he would try to hop the fence while I was gone but when I got back after 30 seconds, he was gone. I scanned the area briefly to make sure he didn't sneak in, but it all looked clear, so I continued with my patrol. Going through the whole yard takes about 15 minutes, but sometimes I'd go slower just to pass the time. I went all the way around and decided to check back on the spot where I saw the man. I really didn't have anything better to do anyway. I started driving down there, and almost immediately I spotted the man again. He was inside the yard standing on the gravel path. I drove up closer again, but the man didn't move. I exited the golf cart and started walking up to him. He looked like a 40-year-old man. I stopped just a few feet away from him. Sir, you can't be in here. I need to escort you out, I said but he didn't even turn his head to look at me. After a second, a slight rush of fear went through me. Sir, I need you to come with me. I reached out my hand gently to tap his shoulder. As soon as I did, he whipped his head around to look at me. He just stared into my eyes. He looked full of rage. I took my hand away and the man turned around and started walking away. I got back on my golf cart, preparing to call the police as I watched him go all the way down to the fence. 
He stepped over it and continued walking away. I was relieved but still terrified. I drove straight back to the faculty building and went inside. It was a small single room security type building, but I felt a lot safer and calmer inside. I sat down and caught my breath. In all my years, I'd never really been scared because it was always just people messing around, but this was different. I waited inside for a while, I'm not sure how long, until I heard a bang on the door. I jumped out of my chair and stared at the door in fear. A few seconds later, they banged on the door again. These were aggressive knocks, not those of someone friendly. I had nowhere to go. I picked up the desk phone and called 911. I didn't know what they wanted or why they were here, but I wasn't going to risk it all to find out. After probably three minutes of them banging on the door, I heard them walk away. I still waited for the police to arrive before I opened the door. The following day, my manager was able to pull the CCTV security footage from the building. What I saw was horrifying. Just minutes after I entered the building, the man I'd seen in the yard earlier walked up to the door. He stood there silently for nearly 15 minutes before he banged on the door. He was also holding something in his hand, but the footage wasn't detailed enough to make out the object. It was likely a small pipe or bat of some sort. The man was never identified, but I still work the same job at the graveyard and haven't seen him since. I had been working the night shift at the gas station for almost a year at this point. It's not the best job, but it pays my bills. The hours are long and the work is repetitive. I had thought many times about quitting and finding work somewhere else, and this incident was my breaking point. It was a typical night at the gas station. I had just finished cleaning off the pumps and restocking the shelves when I saw the headlights of a car pulling into the lot. It was an old beat-up car with tinted windows. As the car pulled up to the pump, I could see that there was only one person inside. He got out and started walking up to the door. It was a man, probably in his mid-thirties. He had dark hair and was wearing a black leather jacket and looked like he hadn't slept in days. I greeted him with a smile and asked him if he needed any help. He didn't say anything but just threw a $20 bill on the counter and went back out to fill up his tank. It was a bit rude, but that's normal when working at a gas station, especially late at night when nobody wants to talk. I watched out the window as he filled up his tank, but a couple of minutes passed and he was still there with the pump in his car. I knew he only put $20 in, so he had to have finished a while ago. I waited another couple of minutes. Then I opened the door and started to say something, asking if he needed any help. But he just got back in his car and drove away. I blew it off and went back inside the store. But as the night wore on, I started to feel like something was off. I don't know how else to describe the feeling. Nobody else was pulling in to get gas and it was really quiet outside. Then I heard a noise coming from the back of the store. It sounded like a box falling off a shelf. I grabbed a flashlight and slowly made my way to the back of the store. As I turned the corner, there was a man standing there going through our inventory. He was tall and skinny and looked like he hadn't showered in weeks. I froze in fear, not sure what to do. The man turned and saw me, and for a moment we just looked at each other. Then he started to walk towards me, his eyes fixed on mine. I backed away slowly, putting my hands up as if to not mean any harm, but he kept coming towards me. I could smell alcohol on his breath, and I knew that he was dangerous. Money, or is it he said, slurring his words. In one of his hands he had a switchblade, and with him being clearly drunk I was really scared. I pointed toward the register, and he pushed me back to the counter. As I was opening the till, the man wandered around the store, making his way to the liquor section. He stashed a few expensive bottles in his backpack, then came back to the register. 
I put all the bills we had on the counter, barely over a hundred dollars. The man looked at it, then looked at me. The hell is this? I need more, man, he wasn't satisfied, but there was no more money to give. He flipped open his blade, waving it around and yelling at me. I was sure he was going to jump the counter and beat me to death, but then he suddenly swiped the cash and bolted out the door. My heart was pounding as I looked out the window, seeing that same beat up car from earlier. The man got inside and they drove off. The police came a few minutes later, responding to the emergency button I pressed while the man was browsing the booze, but they weren't too helpful right away. Thankfully, the cameras outside the building were able to pull a license plate from the car, and four days later I was informed that both men were caught. Apparently they were homeless and had stolen the car. They then went on a crime spree, robbing as many stores as they could, mostly just of alcohol and money. I feel pretty lucky to have made it unharmed because their erratic behavior sent one worker to the hospital after an encounter with them. A couple of weeks later, I quit my job and moved to work the day shift somewhere else. I'm a receptionist at a local hotel and most of my shifts are overnight. I'm in charge of the front desk, and my main responsibilities are to check in guests, answer phone calls, and keep an eye on the security cameras. It's usually a pretty quiet job since our hotel isn't the biggest or busiest. This night, the hotel was mostly empty. There were only a few guests staying with us. I was sitting at the front desk on my phone when I saw a man start walking towards the doors outside. I stood up and greeted him when he came inside. He looked up at me with bloodshot eyes and said, I need a room for the night he was definitely high on something, but regardless, I checked him in and gave him a key to his room. It was standard to allow walk-in bookings when the hotel was less than 75% full. He started walking toward the elevators, and I sat back down and pulled my phone out. A few hours later, I was sitting at the front desk when I heard a noise coming from the hallway. It was a thump sound, like a door trying to be forced open. I got up and walked around the corner to the end of the hallway. The man I checked in a few hours ago was standing there trying to open up one of our maintenance doors. Can I help you find something I asked? He looked over at me with those creepy eyes. I asked again, but he just stared at me. I wasn't really sure what to think. Maybe he was really high and looking for the vending machine or something. I didn't know. I didn't want to anger the man though, so I went back to my desk and forgot about it. A good amount of time passed with no activity no sounds from any of the rooms, nobody entering the building or walking through the halls. It was around three in the morning and I did a small walk around the bottom floor just to keep myself awake and busy. As I got to the hallway by the front desk though, I heard a very sudden loud banging coming from one of the rooms. I stopped and listened for a moment, then went up the stairs to the second floor where I thought it came from. It was very quiet now, which made me somewhat nervous. I walked down the hall hearing nothing, but when I reached the end, one of the room's doors was open. I listened again for a second before lightly knocking. Nobody responded. I cautiously peeked inside, unsure of what to expect. It seemed empty. I wasn't comfortable walking all the way inside though, so I couldn't really look around, but I was sure nobody was inside. I closed the door and looked at the room number 112. That was the room I'd given to the man. I never saw him exit the building though. I quickly walked back down to the front desk. I looked at all the security cameras we had in the lobby and outside the building, but the man didn't turn up. I jumped when the hotel phone rang. One of the rooms was calling. I picked it up. Hello, how can I help you? There was a woman on the line telling me about some man knocking on her door in the middle of the night. 
I apologized and assured her I would take care of it. I hung up and took a deep breath. I was getting really nervous now. I walked around the desk, but then again the phone started ringing. It was someone else from a different room this time, saying he had the same experience as the other woman, someone knocking at his door in the middle of the night. I called the police right away. I stood by the front doors until they arrived, just in case I needed a quick escape. Luckily they came before anything happened, but they didn't find the man. Instead, they found a broken window in his room where he likely jumped out. It was on the second story, though, so I'm not sure how he managed to get away without some major injuries. Later, while the police were still searching, they got a report that the card he used to pay for the room was stolen. It's unclear what the man intended to do or why he was knocking on people's doors. I'm thankful none of them opened their doors, though, because this case could have been much worse if they had. I was walking down the aisles of the store while my car was parked outside. I filled my basket with a few essentials that I always buy bananas, eggs, and bread. Then, I walked around for a while, trying to decide if there was anything else that I wanted. I eventually made my way to the till and paid for my gas, as well as the grocery items. I walked out the large glass door at the front of the store. I could see that my car was parked next to one of the pumps. The parking lot was dark, but the bright lights from the gas pumps were like a bright oasis. I started walking towards my car, and as I got closer, I could tell that there was somebody sitting in my back seat. I don't usually lock my doors when I go in because it's usually pretty quick, but this time I was in there for a while longer than normal. Also, my car is pretty old, so you have to lock them all manually. I know it's not smart, but those are my excuses, so take it for what you will. I inched closer to get a look at the person. It appeared to be an older woman, hunched over, her hair covering most of her face. The shade from the roof of my car formed a dark corner in the back seat where she was sitting, so it was hard to tell much about her. My first thought was that it was an elderly woman who wandered into my car, confused. I stood a few feet away from the car while I thought about the situation. I considered simply giving her a ride to wherever she was going. I'm always willing to help people in need, but some part of me thought that was not a good idea. After a minute or two, I decided to call the police. I hate to get the police involved for something like this, and I made sure that they knew it was not an emergency or anything. Also, I did not want to press any charges. When the police arrived, I talked to the officers for a few minutes. After that, they told me to wait by the building to give them some distance. I couldn't see much from there, and the bodies of the two police officers were blocking what little view I might have had. I could tell that they opened the back door of my car, and before I knew it, they had pulled the person out of the back seat and put her in handcuffs. I thought that was unnecessary, so I ran over shouting for them to stop. In my mind, it was just a confused old woman who wandered into my car by accident. But as I got closer, I could tell that it was not a woman at all. It was an older man, probably 50 or 60 years old, with long gray hair and several large tattoos on his face and hands. For some reason that I never figured out, he seemed to be wearing a hospital gown over his clothes. I stopped in my tracks when I realized that. Then one of the officers yelled at me to stay back. I backed up a few steps and continued to watch in disbelief. My heart sank when I noticed something. When the man was being frisked, I saw them remove a large hunting knife from under his gown. I've been a security guard for over a decade now, and in that time I've seen some strange things. However, nothing could have prepared me for the night when this story took place. It was 2018, 
and I was working the night shift at a downtown hotel. The job was really easy. I was really into sci-fi books at the time, and I had a lot of time to read. There was a security office at the back of the building where I spent most of my time. Other than that, I would do a few patrols of the building and the parking lots every few hours throughout the evening. It was a typical quiet night at the hotel. I was making my rounds, checking doors and windows when I heard a loud noise coming from the parking lot. At first I thought it might be a car backfiring, but as the noise continued, I knew something was wrong. It was 2.30 in the morning, and the place was an absolute ghost town. Any noise at all stood out like a sore thumb, so those loud thuds I was hearing in the parking lot were very concerning. I immediately called the police and then headed towards the source of the noise. As I approached the parking lot, I saw a figure in a hoodie trying to break into a car. My heart was pounding in my chest as I shone my flashlight at him and ordered him to stop. As soon as I let those words out, he took off running. I chased after him, my breaths coming in gasps as I tried to keep up. I just needed to stay with him long enough for the police to show up. He was fast, and I was starting to lose ground when he suddenly disappeared. I stopped and shone my flashlight in every direction, but I saw no sign of him. Just when I thought I lost him, I heard a faint noise coming from a nearby alley. My hand went to my weapon, which was a can of pepper spray, as I cautiously approached. That's when I saw him. The man was hiding behind a dumpster, trying to catch his breath. I ordered him to surrender, but he refused. He came at me with a wild look in his eyes and then jumped on me. Before I knew it, we were rolling around on the ground, fighting. I was cursing myself for following this man. I should have waited for the police, I thought. The man was strong, but I was able to overpower him and subdue him until the cops arrived. The man turned out to be a wanted felon with a long history of violence and theft. It's been a few years now, but I still think about that night. The feeling of fear, the adrenaline rush, and the physical struggle with the criminal will always be part of me. I'm grateful for the training I received and I know it helped me handle the situation as best I could. However, I also know that being a security guard is more than just making rounds and checking doors. It's about being prepared for anything.